Hello, good evening, and welcome. News feeds the show. Tuesday, November 30th is the date. I'm Blake Berman. And I'm Kara Husted. Tonight on News Feed, minority enrollment is up at the University of Michigan. President Bush visits Canada, and Martha Stewart may soon be seen on reality TV. And first up, your campus news. Starting next fall, LSNA students may be able to declare a minor in international relations. The LSA student government started lobbying for the minor last fall. You got scroll the teleprompter a little bit, following student demands for it and the fact that Michigan is the only Big Ten school without an international relations program. The program would include political science, economics, comparative literature, and history classes and will be the first step in creating an international relations concentration. Officials are still dis discussing whether or not the program would be divided into two minors, one having a cultural focus and the other having a traditional international relations focus. The cultural focus minor could possibly be housed in the comparative literature department with the traditional, folk, traditional minor being either housed in the economics or political science department. Budget cuts, they're not expected to have any effect on, on the minor whatsoever. The courses will also be those that are already in existence. Reports have revealed that minority enrollment in the University of Michigan Medical School has soared over this past year. Minority applications to the school last year increased 41.5% from 445. Meanwhile, the general applicant pool grew only slightly. UM Medical School Director of Admissions, Robert Ruiz, said the school used many of the same recruiting techniques it always has, including a fairly aggressive outreach program, working with the diversity office within the medical school. What changed was the national perception of the U University of Michigan as an institution that truly values diversity, he said. The latest statistics on minority applicants and enrollees reflect the first admission cycle since the U.S. Supreme Court decision on the University of Michigan's affirmative action policy in June of 2003. AAMC President Jordan J. Cohen believes the increases in black and Hispanic enrollments indicate that medical schools view the court's decision as providing support for their efforts to assemble a diverse medical school class. This year's minority enrollment is one of the highest ever at the school. Of the current first year class of 170 students, 21% are minorities. That includes 18 African Americans, 17 Hispanics, and two Native Americans. Researchers at the University Medical School have received a five-year, multi-million dollar government grant contract to study anthrax and search for ways to develop new vaccines and drugs. The $5.9 million contract is from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. UM was chosen as one of seven government-granted funded biodefense pro, pro research centers. This is a new, this, this teleprompter is killing us, huh? The bacterium which causes the scientists, they really don't know what's going on, nor do we just keep scrolling the teleprompter a little bit down. There we go. Understand uh, what is going on. The co-director of UM Center and an assistant professor of microbiology and immun immunology of the school's medical school said. There we go. Does that make sense? No. Researchers hope to understand more about the disease by creating the first comprehensive inventory of the genes and proteins active in the bacterium during stages of infection. Researchers hope their work paves the way for new drugs to treat a person who becomes infected by the bacterium. Common drugs are currently used in treatments, but there is a concern that terrorists might unleash a form of the disease-causing agent that is drug-resistant. And turning now to your local news, Ann Arbor's homeless population is already feeling the effects of winter's cold. With overcrowding fast becoming a serious problem in homeless shelters, people are often turned away with only a blanket to survive the night. The lucky few who do get a bed in either YMCA shelter or the Robert J. Dillacente are forced to leave by 7 a.m., leaving them wandering the streets all day with nowhere to go. A few churches and programs have given aid in the form of food to help the homeless get through the holidays. The Harvest Missionary Community Church in particular hopes to serve monthly dinners to the city's homeless. Lincoln District voters will be asked on February 22nd to approve a $95 million bond issue to build a new high school and to convert the current school into two new middle schools. The school board set the election date at its meeting Monday night. In addition, bond money would be used to convert an existing middle school into two elementary schools. All of this will happen on the school's campus in Ypsilanti Township. That same Ypsilanti Township resident Clay, Clay Marengo, one of two people who spoke before the vote, questioned the plan to change the middle school into two elementary schools and asked whether the high school was big enough to house two middle schools. 
One of the reasons given previously for the change is that it will allow for smaller class sizes. The need for more schools is a result of a projected increase in the school age population of the district during the next 10 to 15 years. Kids just popping up everywhere. A study projected 5,000 new homes would be built in the district within the next five years. This could mean between 2,500 and 4,000 new students. The district now has about 5,100 new students and a bouncing teleprompter. The new Hudson man who died after a struggle with police in Heartland Township Thanksgiving morning had been sub subdued with a taser gun before he stopped breathing at the scene. Officials said Charles C. Kaiser, 47, scuffled with police after he drove a piece of earth-moving equipment onto U.S. 23 near M59. Police say Kaiser drove a bulldozer from a nearby road construction site onto U.S. 23 just before morning rush hour. And when police arrived, he was on a backhoe, apparently trying to start it so he could, not, he could move it onto the freeway also. Two state police officers chased Kaiser into a nearby woods and scuffled with him. Livingston County Sheriff-elect Bob Bizot said Kaiser was attempting to strangle one of them when four sheriff deputies arrived to assist. Bizot said one sheriff's deputy used a taser as a last resort in an effort to control Kaiser, delivering a drive stun instead of the, ki the kind of which darts are used to shock a person. He used the weapon three times before finally subdu subduing Kaiser. The sheriff's department started using tasers about a year ago, Bizot said, adding they have been an effective tool in handling potentially deadly situations. He said officers would have been justified in using even more force during the struggle with Kaiser. A recent Air Force study cited in New York Times found tasers to have the potential for being dangerous and that more data is needed to evaluate the risks. Amnesty International has called a moratorium on the use of tasers until their safety can be verified with an outside study. However, police in major U.S. cities credit tasers in part for the dramatic drop in the number of people killed by police in the last few years. Eastern Michigan University won its appeal of an unfair labor practice charged filed by the faculty union allowing it to continue to promote faculty to academic posts while they serve in administrative roles. Since the tug of war began about two years ago, there's been a change in the top administration for both the university and the faculty union. While officials from the EMU American Association of University Professors say that all academic pr promotions must follow the procedure, they say the dispute should have been settled in-house. The union filed the complaint with the Michigan Employment Relations Commission after Michael Harris, a faculty member who was named associate provost, was promoted from associate to full professor while working as an administrator faculty. Faculty union officials say at the time, that a faculty member who leaves teaching must return to teaching at the same academic rank. An administrative law judge in May, May 2003 ordered EMU academic promotions. They had to get academic promotions to faculty who are in administrative roles. EMU appealed the decision to the full commission, which overturned the ruling earlier this month. The ruling does not affect Harris. He left Eastern last summer for an administrative post at Ferris State University. And coming up on news feed, we're going to try to fix this whole teleprompter thing. It's all new. Kara and I might talk about it. If not, <laughs> the fun will continue. Stay away. Oh, my God.
and welcome back to Ann Arbor's only local news program, Newsfeed. I'm Kara Husted, and tonight in your national news, <laughs> Homeland <wrong>. Security, <laughs> Homeland Security, resigned Tuesday, but he will remain in the post until February 1st, unless a successor is confirmed sooner. The former two-term governor of Pennsylvania added that after 22 years in public service, he plans to get more involved in personal and family matters. Ridge 59 met with President Bush on Tuesday morning before the president headed to Canada. According to one official, he then met with his department's senior staff and told them of his plans to leave. Ridge is the first secretary of the department, which was created in the wake of the terrorist attacks of September 11th of 2001. It folded 22 agencies with 180,000 employees into one organization charged with developing and coordinating a national strategy to protect against terrorist threats or attacks in the United States. Perhaps, perhaps his highest move was to oversee the creation of the color-coded threat warning system. During his time as advisor and secretary, the national threat level was raised from yellow, elevated to orange, high, and back six times, and is currently at the present time at yellow. We are 99.9% .9 sure it's him. This coming today from Mark Young, the Montrose County Coroner, investigating the Sunday morning plane crash of NBC Sports Chairman Dick Ebersole. The body in question is Ebersole's 14-year-old son, Edward Ebersole, and his older son, 21-year-old Charles, survived the crash destined for South Bend, Indiana, where Charles attends school. You've got to get your elbows out of the picture. For the search for Edward ended today with the coroner's conclusion after dinner records were flown in to confirm if the body underneath the plane's rubble is indeed Edward's. Also killed in the crash was pilot Alberto Estaya and flight attendant Warren Richardson III. The unidentified co-pilot remains in critical condition in the burn unit of a nearby Denver hospital. The National Transportation Safety Board is investigating the case. No timetable is set for the NTSB's conclusion as to what caused the accident. A sharp increase in deadly accidents involving U.S. Marine Corps aircraft has forced a close look at possible causes. Officials said on Tuesday, from October 2003 through t September 2004, the Marines sustained 18 major accidents, including the deaths of 15 aviators and the loss of 21 helicopters and fighter planes. Most of the accidents came during training missions in the United States. The others occurred during combat operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. Those numbers mark the worst year for Marine Corps aviation safety in more than 10 years, according to Marine records. Marine officials deny that the increased pace of combat operations contributed to the high accident rate, saying it was due instead to a leadership problem in the aviation ranks. Some commanders have already been relieved. In one case, five commanders from a Marine squadron in Iraq were fired in October because of a high accident rate within that group. One month into the new fiscal year, the Marines have sustained no major aviation accidents. Earlier today, President Bush visited Canada speaking with Canadian's Prime Minister Paul Martin in Ottawa to discuss everything from Iraq to cows. The invasion of Iraq has been widely viewed negatively in Canada, as well as the U.S.'s decision to not import Canadian meat since the 2002 mad cow disease scare. Bush and Martin fielded questions from Canadian reporters for 15 minutes. One topic Bush addressed was the nearby U.S.-Canadian border crossing right down the road at Detroit and Windsor. Bush stated that the U.S. has greatly increased security measures at that border since the terrorist attacks on U.S. soil nearly three years ago. Several of the 9-11 hijackers entered the United States through Canada, as you might remember. While the calm press conference held a warm feel about it, it was anything but that outside. Protesters surrounded the nearby chilly streets. Police were in riot gear. They were brought to subdue the crowds. It was just an ugly, ugly, ugly scene. Bush will leave the northern neighbor tomorrow afternoon. And tonight in your international news, a powerful storm has triggered landslides and flash floods that have killed as many as 350 people in the eastern Philippines, according to officials. Rescuers are now racing to the region to try to save people stranded in three coastal towns before a new typhoon strikes that same area. At least 150 people are missing in the eastern Philippines, which is lar largely cut off by landslides and floodwaters, which have washed away bridges and roads, officials say. Adding to the misery, forecasters are predicting a new typhoon circling off the Pacific coast that could hit as early as today. Officials are arranging for a Coast Guard boat to head for three worst-hit towns in Quezon Province, 
to deliver supplies or pick up evacuees. The Philippines is hit with about 20 storms and typhoons a year. A typhoon and another storm last week killed at least 87 people and left 80 others missing in the eastern region. Unfortunately, moving to some more wicked weather, it's been here in the U.S. all over the world, too. A Lion Air passenger plane carrying more than 150 people skidded off a runway in central Indonesia during heavy rain and split into two pieces Tuesday, killing at least 31 people. Airline officials said and witnesses said as well. At least 62 people were injured, officials said. Some survivors were still stuck in the wreckage three hours later, media reports said. Just a lot of said going on here. The plane stopped in the East Java town of Surabaya before heading to Solo, where it skidded off the runway, broke up, and came to rest in a nearby cemetery about 100 yards away. Airport officials said Metro TV showed a chaotic scene at the airport with dead and injured passengers lying on the terminal floor and crying relatives searching for the news of their loved ones. The plane sat in darkness. Lian Air spokesman Hasim confirmed the crash and offered condolences to the dead and injured. But he said the cause of the crash was not yet known. Iran's top nuclear negotiator said his country's uranium enrichment program will only be suspended long enough to complete negotiations with Europe, possibly only a few months. Those stressed Iran's intentions were peaceful. The International Atomic Energy Agency, the UN Atomic Watchdog, on Monday adopted a resolution that spells out how it will oversee Iran's agreement to suspend its nuclear program. Speaking at a media conference with Canadian Prime Minister Paul Martin on Tuesday, U.S. President George Bush said the U.S. position remained that Iran should terminate its nuclear weapons program. President Bush said he viewed Iran's decision as a positive step, but said it was certainly not the final step. The United States has accused Iran of trying to build nuclear weapons and wants Iran referred to the U.N. Security Council for possible sanctions. A key move toward building confidence was Iran's decision Sunday to withdraw its demand that it will be allowed to run 20 centrifuges which could be used to enrich uranium for research purposes. Russian parliamentary speaker Boris Grislov has said Ukraine was headed for breakup or bloodshed over its deadlock presidential election. Quote, the situation there is heading towards a split or towards bloodshed. Grislov, who, took briefly, who briefly took part in attempts to mediate between pro-Moscow Prime Minister Viktor Yanukovych and West-leaning Viktor Yushchenko last week, told reporters Russian President Vladimir Putin has openly supported Yukonovich in the Ukrainian poll and congratulated him on winning the election. This is getting worldwide attention. It's just crazy everywhere. Branded by Yushchenko and the West as fraudulent. That's what Yushchenko said. Meanwhile, in Kiev on Tuesday, the country's most senior judges resumed hearings into claims by the Western-leaning opposition leader, Viktor Yushchenko. The election was stolen from him by widespread ballot fraud. And when we come up, sports news. Carrie Etter will be in the hot seat. Will she do better than the Michigan basketball team tonight? We'll see. Probably. All up they got here. smoke. We'll be back in a second.
Welcome back to Newsfeed Sports. I'm Carrie Ederer. Let's recap the pre-Thanksgiving activities for the Michigan sports fans that went home early for turkey dinner. We'll start off with the bitter Wolverine football defeat to Ohio State last week, 37-21. to After a close first half, the Buckeyes steadily marched on Michigan's usually rock-solid defense, scoring 27 unanswered points to a 34-14 lead. With this win, Ohio State shattered Michigan's Big Ten undefeated record to take the 101st win in college football's greatest rivalry. Michigan now stands 9-2 and two overall and co-champions of the Big Ten title with the Hawkeyes. However, Michigan will still have to represent the Big Ten at the Rose Bowl come New Year's Day due to a humiliating Wisconsin defeat to Iowa. Speaking of humiliating, the NBA was humiliated Friday night when players from the Indiana Pacers started attacking Detroit Pistons fans as well as players. The incident stemmed from a push from Detroit's Ben Wallace after Indiana Pacer Ron Artest fouled Wallace from behind. Artest then reacted to debris thrown by a fan, climbing into the stands and throwing punches at several fans. He was joined by teammates Jackson and O'Neal, combining for nine injuries that night. Artest will be suspended for the rest of the season without pay, and Jackson and O'Neal will be gone for 55 games total. This is not the first time Artest has been in trouble, as he was suspended twice from the NBA last season and five times the season before, once grabbing a television camera and smashing it into the ground. We at Wolf TV specifically dislike the smashing of television cameras. It was a tough week for the Wolverine men's basketball team in New York. The team dropped two consecutive games in Madison Square Garden, resulting in a fourth place finish in the preseason NIT tournament. On Wednesday, the Ballers lost their semifinal game to the 20th ranked Arizona Wildcats, 61 to 60 in overtime. In the consolation game on Friday, the Wolverines fell to Providence 72 to 63. Arizona went on to lose to Wake Forest in the final, propelling the Demon Deacons to a first place standing in the NCAA. Michigan was hurt by hard free throw shooting as well as an injury to junior Lester Abram in a game earlier this year against Colorado. Last year's leading scorer for the Wolverines sat out the past three games and is questionable for tomorrow's game against Georgia Tech. The game starts at 3 o'clock in Atlanta. The women's basketball team had a much better time than the men did on Friday in an upset win over the Gauchos of UC Santa Barbara. The Lady Wolverines won 57-51 to in an impressive road victory. Senior forward Tabitha Poole had an outstanding game for Michigan as she put up 19 points and pulled down 10 rebounds. She also nailed a three-pointer with little time left in the second half to seal the game. Freshman Tisha Walker also had a great outing, leading the team with 22 points. The team is currently playing Drake here in Ann Arbor. That's it for sports. Back to you, Blake. Gary, thank you. Martha Stewart, well, she's had some pretty big plans while she's in jail. She can prepare for it. But what she's going to do after she's released from prison, this is all starting to come out. The so-called domestic diva has a new show in the works, a reality TV show. The reality TV show is still in the development stages but should follow an elimination format similar to Survivor or The Apprentice. What I want to see is Survivor of Martha in jail. That's really what I want to see. I was talking to Kara at the break, and she said the same thing. Mark Burnett, who produced both of the shows, is signed on to work the new show. Stewart's syndicated TV show will also resume upon her release from prison. Martha Stewart Living will resume starting its 14th st season. Stewart is currently slamming, slamming, serving, five months in the slammer. <laughs> and a potential new lie detecting test may have been discovered by researchers at Temple University. Magnet magnetic resonance image scans, MRIs, of people who are lying look different than those people who are telling the truth. MRIs showed that different areas of the brain were used in telling the truth when volunteers were split into two groups, one lying and obviously one not. Lying seems to take up more energy by the brain than does telling the truth. The frontal lobes of the brain were involved in lying. These areas are also used when showing emotional responses to certain things. The new MRI device is very expensive, but researchers think it could be useful in extreme cases, such as the questioning of terrorism suspects. Well, that's it. Wow, that was fast. Thankfully, right? <laughs> Less, lesson learned, teleprompters aren't as easy as you think they are. Dealing with a little new equipment. Yeah, it takes we got, time. We got teleprompters time. for uh, the first time in 10, in ten years of Wolf TV history. We got teleprompters. Yes. yes. It scrolls a little fast sometimes, a little too slow. We're going to work the kinks up. out. I can't keep up. I, I mean, know. 
after reading too much history and you come in here and read news feed, it's, it's too much. Different pace. All right. Tony. I got a flag football game to go to. <laughs> All right, everyone. We're going to end this. We'll see you next night. Tuesday night. Bye bye.